Thank you, Grace, and welcome everyone again. It's good to see you. You came back for more, so I guess that's a good, uh, a good sign this morning. Um, I want to just say a word as I begin to remind you a bit about how we started last week. Uh, and I talked about the fact that religion is a word that comes to us from Latin, from the word religare, meaning, does anyone remember? <laughs> Repetition is the best teacher. I learned that a long time ago. To bind together. Uh, when we come to a religion, we are coming to a way in which a community of people bind together their understanding of reality. And the way they answer the sort of the Nash five questions of human existence. Why am I here? Um, why do I suffer? Um, is there anybody up there? Why should I behave? What happens to me when I die? Those sorts of questions that bind our experience together. And so in some sense, when we come to a religion, we really are stepping onto sacred ground, whether it's our religion or not, because we believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is reaching out to humanity. And it is an intrinsic part of who we are as human beings to reach out to God, to make sense of our experience. And so when we come to religion, it's really nothing more or less than the way in which a particular group of people seeks to understand the divine and to understand reality. Today we talk about uh, Buddhism. I'd like to do a little review of Hinduism, but we really don't have time. So we'll hasten on. But remember, repetition's the best teacher. So go back and look through that handout from last week and kind of keep those ideas fresh in your mind, because I can assure you, in the course of wandering around Atlanta, you're going to be bumping into Buddhists and Hindus and uh, Muslims and all sorts of folks. And it says something about you as a person if you are able to at least have some conversation with people about their faith and to uh, care about the way in which they make sense of reality and then to enter into some conversation with them about it. Today, Buddhism. Uh, and I'm going to start by uh, asking you to do a very Buddhist thing, and that is to simply breathe. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, hold it, just hold it, hold it, now breathe. Interesting way to start, right? The reality is, as you held your breath there for a few moments, that really, that act of breathing and not breathing is all that stands between you and death. That's it. If you held your breath long enough, or you were, someone caused you to have to hold it long enough, you would die, right? And it wouldn't take long. Just a matter of seconds. Perhaps a couple of minutes or two or three and you would be gone. Isn't that a cheery thought to start with as we talk about Buddhism? In fact, I want you to look around the room. I want you to feel that chair that you're in. Sort of feel the edges of it. Um, and uh, hold it just a moment. Grab the metal part of it there. Because I'm going to uh, let you in on a pretty remarkable thought this morning. Chances are good that the metal on that chair will be around far longer than you will. Look at this building, this church, the walls, you built it. Chances are good it will be here long after you are gone. The things we own, 
that we think we possess and we control, that we make, are actually more permanent than we are. And it was this thought about our own impermanence that came to the Buddha in the 6th, 5th centuries BC and that caused him to develop the ideas and philosophy that he did. Another way to put this, uh, how many of you can name all four full names of your grandparents? Would you raise your hand? All four. You can whip off all four full names. All right, hands are slowly going up. You're having to think through it a moment. You people are having to think through the full names of your own grandparents. Think about that for a moment. All right, you did pretty well on grandparents. Let's try great-grandparents. How many people in this room can name the full names of all eight of your great-grandparents? Raise your hand. Can't, you don't look at anything, no uh, papers or family histories. Raise your hand. Nobody? Nobody in this room can name all eight of your great-grandparents. All right, let me put this in about 120 years or so, there may be someone here talking about religions, and they may be asking members of this congregation to name their great-grandparents. And guess what? Your great-grandchild will probably not be able to name you. It's rather sobering, isn't it? 120 years, and most of our names will disappear from the face of the earth. Now, we'll be in a cemetery some, somewhere, but how many people have died in the history of the world? Anybody know? A bunch. A bunch. Um, and where are they all buried? Our oldest cemeteries, you know, we, they may be a couple hundred, three hundred years old, but the reality is all those people are dead and buried, and the bulk of them, nobody even knows where they're buried. They have absolutely disappeared from the face of the earth, their cemetery plot. And so cemeteries really are there to sort of make us think, right, that our name is going to be remembered. I mean, people actually sell us a cemetery plot. Why? Because we want to be remembered. But what they know that they don't tell us is it doesn't matter. We will still never be remembered because eventually they're going to need to build a, build a big building on top of that cemetery or something is going to happen a few decades or centuries from now and we're still going to disappear from memory. We are impermanent. Despite our best effort to think that we are permanent, our existence is an impermanent existence. I put up a little cartoon here. Um, this is a Buddhist compliment. I've never met anyone so thoughtless in my life, says the abbot. Keep up the good work. And the disciple responds, thank you, Master. Now, what is this about in Buddhism? Uh, part of it has to do with this coming to grips with our own impermanence and the relative uselessness of most of the anxieties that you and I have 
in the course of our lives. I don't know if you've ever had a sleepless night because you were so worried about something. And perhaps you've tried what I try, and that is, instead of counting sheep, which is the same sort of thing, I try to count backward from 100 to zero. And to not have any thought other than that process of counting backward from 100 to zero slowly. One of the things you're going to discover if you try to do it is that it is impossible. Almost. See, how, see what number you get to before that thinking brain of yours spins you off into some thinking thought direction. And then stop and go back and start over at 100 and see how long it takes you to actually get to zero without really allowing your brain to be consumed by all those thoughts that take us in all those directions and all our fears and anxieties and hopes and desires. So the point in Buddhism, in some sense, is to bring about what is called in some sense here, thoughtlessness, to control the mind to such an extent that we possess it instead of it possessing us. There is in Buddhism what is called the three jewels. The three jewels in Buddhism are in some sense almost the same as the three jewels in Christianity. Um, and I'm going to throw them out here for you. The first one is the Buddha, the teacher. One of the jewels is the teacher. And so when someone becomes Buddhist, in the same way that we say one accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives, the Buddhists say this sort of phrase, I take refuge in the Buddha. And then they say, I take refuge in the Dharma. Now, the, I'm putting the Buddhist words up here so you become familiar with them. But the, the Buddha is the teacher. The Dharma is the teaching. So I take refuge in the teaching of the teacher. And then the last one is, I take refuge in the Sangha, which is the community. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the teachings of the Buddha. I take refuge in the community of uh, people to whom I've attached myself and from whom I learn. And so you can see, um, when Buddhists come to faith in Jesus Christ, one of the things they sometimes say is, I take refuge in Jesus. I take refuge in the teachings of Jesus. I take refuge in the church of Jesus Christ. It's a way of coming to faith through the worldview and understanding of one who has grown up in that tradition. So the three uh, jewels. And I'm going to uh, talk today uh, and organize what we talk about around these three jewels. So we're going to talk first about the Buddha himself. And I put up a map here of Buddhist sites. If you were going to uh, go to India, Nepal, right there on that border of northern India, southern Nepal, you would find there uh, really the, the place of the Buddha, where the Buddha was born, where he lived, where uh, he sat under the Bodhi tree and attained enlightenment. Uh, we went to that place, Bodh Gaya, this past May with uh, students from McAfee School of Theology. And uh, this, is the, this is his place, sort of, uh, if you will, the Galilee uh, for him, the area in which he did his teaching and focus during the course of his life. He was born about 563 and died about 483 uh, B.C., so sort of the 6th and 5th centuries B.C., uh, he was part of the warrior Kshatriya class, um, the 
um, that, that particular group of people in uh, India. Uh, he was born to a king, uh, King Shudhodana in, uh, in India. His mother was Mahamaya. Mahamaya had a dream that a white elephant entered her body. And uh, later, the Buddha would say that uh, he came out of her body from her side without causing any suffering or pain or anguish for her. He grew up in a very sheltered environment in the palace because someone had told his father that as long as he remained in the palace, he would become a great ruler. But if he ever went out into the world, he would become a great religious leader. Now, you know, you always, you know, your, your child tells you they want to go to seminary. You tell them what? You'll never make any money. Go into business. Uh, so this was the same sort of struggle that the Buddha's father was having. So the Buddha uh, lived in the palace until one day he heard someone sing a song about what life was, out, was like out in the world. And he decided he wanted to see that. So one day he left the palace and he went out into the world. And as he wandered around out there for a few days, he saw four different people. He saw a sick person he saw an old person, he saw a dead person, and he saw a hermit, a wandering man who was pursuing uh, spiritual truth in life. And after he saw all that, he was deeply troubled because he realized that life wasn't all the great stuff he had experienced in the palace, but instead life was a life of suffering. And so he left the palace. And he went out, he left his wife, he left his son Rahula behind. And sort of renouncing all of that, he went out in search of truth and meaning in the context of life. He attached himself to a couple of teachers. In time he found no meaning and purpose in their teaching. He found five companions. They set off to try to understand the world. And in time, he decided that deprivation was the way to go, that he would, uh, would refuse anything, any food, anything that would bring um, any kind of um, health or benefit to him, and he would engage in that path of renunciation. Uh, he, was de he, he determined, as he sort of uh, came to this point of, of starvation, and you see here the emaciated Buddha, he decided that this was an absolutely empty path. And you see the sort of hole, almost a mouth in his stomach, that represented uh, the desire for food and so forth that he was cutting himself off from. Uh, finding this path empty, he determined then to find the middle way between deprivation and suffering and indulgence, the experience that he had had in the palace. And so he set off to find the middle way. He ate a meal that a woman offered to him. His five companions re rejected him because of it. And he went on his way and determined that he would sit under a Bodhi tree until he figured it all out. And so he sat under that tree. And as he sat there, a tempter named Mara came to him. Mara was, uh, in, in Buddhist thinking, realizing that if the Buddha attained enlightenment, then Mara's role in the world would be lessened because people would begin to follow 
his path. And so he comes and he tempts the Buddha. Violent storms come, all sorts of violence. Weapons are thrown at him. Uh, he is seduced. And that entire time, he remains absolutely unmoved under the Bodhi tree. And finally, Mara comes to him and begins to do the self-doubt thing, sort of like the devil does with Jesus in the wilderness. Uh, why do you think you have it all together? Uh, aren't you like all other people? And the Buddha simply puts his hand down and touches the ground. And in that moment, he sees reality for what it really is. He sees all of his past lives, the births and rebirths through the eons of time that he has experienced. And he comes to understand the true meaning of existence as far as he uh, can grasp it. Here are the, the insights that he comes to um, and that he will then teach over the course of time. So we move here in some sense from the Remember, you take refuge in the Buddha, to now you take refuge in the Dharma, or the teachings of the Buddha. So what are those teachings? They're rather powerful, really, in some of their insights. We suffer. No duh, right? Life is suffering. If there's anything we can uh, say beyond a shadow of a doubt, we will all suffer at some point in the course of our lives. But for the Buddha, this suffering was slightly different from the way that we understand suffering. Um, it's interesting if you think about life. You think about going to a Braves game as being a really exciting thing to do, and you look forward to it, and you're, you're excited about it. And, um, you get there, and what do you do in the seventh inning? You stretch, and then you leave. Why do you leave? Because of all the traffic, right? Uh, so you don't even complete the game sometimes, because you're starting to be anxious about the next thing that might happen to you, and so you go and you leave the game. Have you ever noticed on Christmas morning how excited you are? Everybody opens the presents. You've been building toward this moment for months and months and months, and all the presents are opened, and everybody's sitting around the room, and then suddenly you're sort of thinking, I feel kind of empty. Um, I kind of expected this to be more than it was. And in every experience that we have in life, there is some um, suffering that goes along with it. The new car isn't the thing that solves all of our problems. We always need something else. It's not enough. A new house, a better house, a bigger house. No, our house is too big. Let's get a smaller house. And it is like this suffering is in there and nothing is ever enough for us. And the Buddha said that suffering has a cause. The cause is tanha. Tanha, craving. I crave the things I don't have. I want this, I want that. And I assume that if I get them, the craving will stop. But guess what? It never stops. It is like a fire that is in us, that is eating us alive. And nothing that we do seems to be able to put it out. 
uh, you know, we, the clothes we have aren't enough. We need more. On and on it goes. We crave, we desire. So suffering has a cause. The end of craving, the end of suffering, is the end of craving. If we can put out the craving and the desire, we can put out the suffering. And there is a path to accomplish that if we will but follow that path. Here, the Buddha is not unlike Jesus. There is so much that Jesus teaches that the Buddha teaches as well. They're, they're both struggling with some of the similar, uh, you know, don't lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Um, and... It's as difficult for us to do it following the teachings of Jesus as it is for Buddhists to do it as they follow the teachings of the Buddha. The paths may be different, but some of the teaching is very similar. Um, the path for the Buddha is the Noble Eightfold Path. And the best approximation of this in Christianity that I can find is uh, something like the Beatitudes. Uh, you know, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Clarence Jordan from um, Koinonia Farms understands the Beatitudes as sort of ladders uh, really down uh, into the kingdom as we, uh, you know, have meekness that leads us to mourning, that leads us to beginning to uh, understand uh, our true calling as followers of Jesus Christ, and eventually to seeking after uh, peace in the world and reconciliation. And then he says, you're going to suffer for this in the way of the world. Uh, but then you are going to understand what it really means to be one with God. So the Noble Eightfold Path is the way for Buddhists. Um, the Buddha doesn't get into a whole lot of doctrinal speculation. He's like Jesus in this sense as well. Jesus doesn't do a whole lot of doctrinal speculation. The Buddha says, uh, don't worry about all that speculative stuff. Uh, he says, if a man is struck by a poisoned arrow. He doesn't sit around going, who shot me? Why did they shoot me? Where did this arrow come from? What does a man who's been shot by a poisoned arrow do? Let me get it out. Let me find a doctor. Let me figure out, uh, you know, how to become well again after having been shot. And so that's where the Buddha heads as well. So here, with this Noble Eightfold Path, and I'll lay out uh, all eight of our, um, of the ways of this path. The first step is to view things properly to come to grips with the impermanence of reality, and particularly with our own impermanence. Um, understand life is kind of an illusion. We think we're here and we're permanent, but we really are not permanent at all. And so he sort of leads us through, uh, you know, have the right intention in your life. Be sure your motivations are the proper motivations. Constantly ask yourself, why am I doing this? Engage in speech that leads to helping others instead of destroying them. Think about, you know, the ways in which we hurt rather than help each other 
with the words that we use, those biting things that we say, that southernism, bless your little heart. What do we really mean when we say it? Engage in right action. Do the right thing. Um, in other words, you're removing all of those negative reasons for doing the things that you do. Uh, have a right livelihood or occupation or calling. Uh, don't engage in occupation that does harm. Um, I heard a story not long ago about a gentleman who was sitting by Mother Teresa on a, an airplane. I think Daniel Vestal actually told this story. And uh, he told her how great a, a model she was for his life and how wonderful all the things that she did with the poor in Calcutta were and he was just so happy and honored to be sitting beside her and then she turned to him and looked at him and said and so tell me what is it you do that matters great question what is it you do that matters what is it I do that matters. I do a lot. All the Buddha is saying here is do the things that matter. The things that make a difference in the world. Uh, put forth right effort. Uh, right mindfulness uh, is kind of an interesting, um, you know, see things properly. What is most important is what is happening now. Our tendency and the, the cause of our suffering is that we're always thinking about what has happened in the past or we're thinking about what is going to happen in the future. But rarely do we simply be in the present without allowing our concerns, all the things that have harmed us in the past that have made us what we are. It's the fault of all of that. And so we suffer because we're looking backward, or we suffer because we're looking forward and hoping that things will be better someday. And the reality is, if we would live now, the chances of ending our suffering would be much better. I had a chat with a Buddhist monk one time, and he was about to leave the monastery and go back to his village. For those of you who may not know a lot about monastic uh, life in, um, say, Thailand, um, the reality is monks may come for the time of their education and then go back into the real world. They may be there for a summer. They may be there for a few days. Uh, but most monks eventually go back to real life. And so I said to this monk, uh, so you're returning to your village. When you get back to your village, will you get married? And he looked at me like I was a crazy person. And he said to me, I don't know whether I will marry or not. Uh, and it suddenly occurred to me that he and I were living in two different universes. He had spent all this time in the monastery, focused on the now, on the present, on training himself to be happy in the moment. And I was asking him to think about what? Whether or not he would ever find a wife. And what does that thought cause us? Suffering. Because we may never get one. Oh my goodness, what if I never get a wife? That would be just so terrible. And then we bump into a friend who says, man, the worst thing that ever happened to me was getting married. <laughs> it really doesn't matter, does it? We're going to suffer I mean, those of you who are married, let's be honest, it is sometimes challenging, right? There are difficulties along the way. Relationships are such that we are going to be wounded in the context of them. And so the Buddha says, live in the now. 
Uh, and then, uh, if we do all of this, if we move toward right understanding, right intention, right speech, right action, all the way down to right, the ability to concentrate, pos uh, concentrate fully on the way things are, we will then achieve what the Buddhists know as nirvana or release from the cycle of birth and rebirth, the cycle of desire. And we will, in some sense, nirvana is an undefined sort of state, but it is best understood as the extinguishing of the flame of a candle. When our desire goes out, we end that process of birth and rebirth in which we have become trapped. Um, it's a very difficult thing to understand. For Buddhists, none of us has been the same from the moment we entered this room. Every millisecond, we are a different person. We have different thoughts. Uh, our cells are dying and being reborn. They say every seven years, I don't know if this is true or not, but every seven years, we are a completely new person physically because of the birth and death of, of cells and so forth in our bodies. Nothing is permanent. And so each moment is a coming together of different experiences, different um, conversations, different sensations. We're cold, then we're hot. Uh, and so for Buddhists, we are never the same self. We're just this stringing together of various selves. And so in that sense, rebirth makes perfect sense. You're just coming back together with those sensations at a different point in time. And so if you extinguish your desire, you put out the flame, in some sense, you become extinct. I asked an abbot once in Chiang Mai, Thailand, I said, I'm having trouble explaining nirvana to my students. Could you help me to uh, help them understand what nirvana is? He said, your question reminds me of the story of the fish and the turtle. The fish and the turtle were swimming in the ocean, and one day the turtle decided to go up on the dry land where he fell asleep in the sunshine and then he woke up and he went back into the water and after a while he bumped into the fish again and the fish said to him, where have you been? How would the turtle answer? The reality for the turtle is a completely different reality than that for the fish. And so the students sort of looked at me and said, yeah, he put you in your place, didn't he? And yes, he did. Uh, Nirvana is impossible for us to grasp and to understand. The wheel of life for Buddhism. I want to sort of unpack the wheel. This is kind of the, the picture that tells the full story. Uh, and we're going to narrow in on such certain parts of it. Here's a little uh, cartoon. I'm worried about my karma, says this reptile to the doctor. And we begin to see in uh, Buddhism, karma is the sum total of the good thoughts and desires and hopes and so forth that we've had, and then the, the bad thoughts and desires. And the goal in life is to allow the good to uh, supersede the bad so that you sort of move up the cycle of birth and rebirth because of the positive karma that you gain. Here's the hub of the wheel of life. And if you look at it closely, I don't know if you can tell, but there are three animals in the hub of the wheel. Uh, there is a pig, there is a rooster, and there is a snake. And these represent the three root evils in Buddhism. The rooster represents greed, the snake represents hate, and the pig represents delusion or ignorance, and these things lead to each other. You can also see in the circle here 
uh, the cycle of birth and rebirth. On the right side, you see people moving. Uh, th this side sort of represents the, the dark side of people moving down through the cycle. And the other side represents uh, people moving up with positive karma through the cycle. Here in the middle, you see the six realms of existence. And those six realms are the realm of the gods, the realm of the demigods, the realm of humans, the realm of animals, the realm of what they call hungry ghosts, and then the realm of hell beings. So these are the realms in which you might live in the, in the course of your uh, births and rebirths in the context of life. So is there heaven in Buddhism? Yes. But is heaven the ultimate goal? No. Heaven is simply where you get to if your positive karma outweighs your bad karma and it's not really a great place to be because there's, again, like Hinduism, there's not a lot of motivation to move out of it. The best place to be is to be a human being because as a human being, you're sort of in touch with what you need to do in the context of all of this. And then the uh, next slide quickly. And I won't go through all of these except to give you a sense. These are the 12 links of dependent origin. Now don't let that big phrase, uh, this is simply uh, the process of enlightenment that we go through as human beings. And it starts with a blind man in, in number one there who is ignorant, who has no idea about reality. And then the potter who engages in actions that will shape his life. And then consciousness, the monkey starting to move up and down the tree, um, representing movement from one life to another. And then uh, name and form, the boat symbolizes form, you see the man in it. Uh, the person symbolizes name. So mental consciousness begins to form. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but eventually, um, at the end of life, you begin to die, and you see the old man there with the cane in the last picture. Uh, so this is the, the cycle of life. And then at the end, you see the Buddha pointing toward enlightenment, uh, who is uh, at the top of the picture uh, in uh, the cycle here, the wheel of life. Finally, Let's talk for just a few moments about the community, the Sangha. And I've got some of the Buddhist history there for you. I'm not going to go through all of it, but the Buddha dies. And at that point, it was believed that he was enlightened and essentially attained that nirvana that I described just a moment ago. They held a council, sort of like a church council. They called everybody together. What did the Buddha say? There was a cousin who recited all of the teaching that he could remember, and those were put into what is called the three baskets, the sacred texts of Buddhism. And Buddhism began to grow, first in northern India, and then it started moving out across all of India via the monks, and then, of course, there was a split. Are you surprised? <laughs> Remember, there are Protestants and Catholics in every religion. There are the Vaishnavites and the Shivites in Hinduism, and there are the Theravadists and the Mahayanists in Buddhism. The Theravadists are the strict interpreters, and the Mahayanists are, I guess, for lack of a better term, they're the more liberal tradition. One, uh, the Theravadists move into Southeast Asia, across Sri Lanka. 
So if you are in Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Thailand, you are in Theravada territory. And if you are in China, Korea, uh, Japan, you are in Mahayana territory. And it is as if they are two different religions in some sense. Um, just a quick word. We all have our Constantine too. Remember Constantine made Christianity the established religion of the Roman Empire. Emperor Asoka does that in India. He encourages the building of stupas with relics of the Buddha, bones of the Buddha, and so forth. And he sends Buddhist missionaries out in all directions who uh, become quite effective. Buddhism disappears by the 13th century, mostly in India. You go to India today, you find Buddhism just, you know, up in the very north and very little anywhere else because essentially of its engagement with Islam, partially, and then it becomes significant in China and other parts of uh, in, in Southeast Asia as well. Here's a Buddhist stupa on the Bagan Plain in Myanmar containing a relic of the Buddha or uh, another follower. Mahayana Buddhism goes to China. Indian emissaries bring it there. Uh, Buddhism grows for, for a long time, many centuries in China, and then it sort of uh, ends its growth uh, about 8th, 9th century uh, B.C. Buddhist schools emerge. I won't go into these, but there are various kinds of Buddhism in Mahayana Buddhism, Tian Tai, Pure Land Buddhism. Um, and these, one of the teachings of Mahayana Buddhism is that there are many Buddhas uh, who come along in the history of the world. Uh, and I will, I could really go off on a tangent there, but we don't have the time. Amitabha Buddha uh, is this Buddha of the pure land, who is a transcendental Buddha with a land of pure bliss to which you go when you uh, are attaining nirvana. So it's slightly different from what we saw in the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, the uh, sort of follower of Amitabha, Avalokiteshvara, and Guanyin, who you'll see in a lot of Chinese Buddhist temples. Maitreya Buddha is the next Buddha of the next age. So if you ever see the fat Buddha, this is Maitreya Buddha as a Chinese monk in one of his previous lives. This is not the Buddha of China, I'm sorry, of India that we've been talking about. I went with a great aunt to a Chinese restaurant one time, and we walked in, and she saw this fat Buddha sitting there, and she said to me, is that Buddha? And I started to say, no, Aunt Sue, that's not Buddha, but I realized I would have to go through all of the stuff I just went through with you, and it would be very complicated. So I just said, yeah, that's that's Buddha, but it's really not. That's a Buddha. It's not the Buddha. You follow me? So you have to sort of clarify that in the context of all of this. Now, Theravada Buddhism in Southeast Asia. Remember, Mahayana in the north, Theravada in the south. Theravada Buddhism is the lesser vehicle, or um, as opposed to the greater vehicle. Why is it the lesser vehicle? Because it is an individual path to enlightenment as opposed to, um, you know, bodhisattvas like Avalokiteshvara and Amitabha sort of helping people along toward enlightenment. In Theravada Buddhism, there is a great emphasis upon the individual path of the monk, or bhikkhu, feminine bhikkhuni, 
who minister to the laity by trying to keep them from evil, exhorting them to good, love, teaching, correction, purification. And there's this great relationship between the monks and the laity where the laity offer care to the monks through their affection, their hospitality, and supplying basic needs. So if you go to Thailand or Myanmar or uh, Cambodia, uh, what you're going to find is this kind of Buddhism. And the Sangha, or community, refers to both the monks and the laity, but it also is generally a reference to that monastic life. And here is a young Buddhist who has entered the monastery. Again, he may choose to do it for a few weeks, a few months, or for his entire life. He does not have to be a monk forever unless he chooses to do so. Some of you may wonder how to become a monk. You have to have the permission of your spouse or parents. You have to be free of debt and disease. You cannot be a slave or a government worker. You have to possess your own robe and alms bowl. You must, uh, as a novice, have a sponsor and teacher who's been a monk for 10 years who will take you under their care. And that's how you become a monk. Uh, and monks, again, live for a few years, a few months, a few weeks, whatever they choose to do. And they study the Buddhist text. They meditate a couple of times a day before the Buddha image. So if you go to a uh, temple, you'll see monks offering candlelight, incense, and flowers to the image. They recite the refuge pledge. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. And they ask for enlightenment to enlighten others. Uh, I won't go into all of this. Um, except to end, um, I'll end with a story, a very interesting little story. When we were traveling in Laos uh, with some students, with our children, uh, we actually went uh, to, uh, got up early in the morning <coughs> and went to watch as folks gathered to offer alms to the monk. Simple act of having rice that you put into the bowl of the monks as they come by. So we stood there with our bowls, and as the monks came, it's a simple act of doing, a, doing good in the world, feeding a fellow human being. And we were putting rice into the bowls of the monks as they came by. And our son, who at the time was probably 12 or so, was running out of rice. And suddenly his bowl was empty. And I was sitting there thinking, oh, this is going to be so embarrassing. There's going to be monks coming, and he's not going to have any rice. And I was, going to tr I was trying to figure out what to do. And suddenly a monk, his own age, two 12-year-olds are looking at each other, and my son has no rice. And suddenly the other 12-year-old starts taking the rice out of his bowl and putting it into my son's bowl, making doing good in the world, which actually became the basis for his college essay, by the way, uh, which uh, I hope got him a bit of a scholarship along the way. This is Buddhism, a faith not so much focused on gods and the worship of God as much as it is when it's really understood, a way of living that tries to help us understand what reality is truly like and the impermanence of our own selves and a proper understanding of the way things are. We have three minutes. Now, if you're not overwhelmed and you have a question or two, I want to try to respond. We've had a couple of weeks of this. I've just done a whole lot of damage to Buddhism, just like someone would do who was Buddhist trying to explain Christianity. But yes, sir. Yes and no. Properly understood in the teachings of the Buddha, 
in the 6th, 5th century, no. There is no God. There is uh, this endless cycle of birth and rebirth from which we want to be released. But as Buddhism evolves over time, and as these other Buddhas emerge, both the original Buddha begin to be worshipped, begins to be worshipped, and other Buddhas begin to be worshipped as well. So the worship, the Buddha that we started with would see worship as desiring something um, and would, would not posit the existence of a god. I hope that helps. Yes, sir. I have not seen the movie either, so I really can't answer the question very well. Um, but the notion of an avatar as a, a being that is sort of the um, representation of a god or goddess, I, does that operate at the heart of the, of the movie? How, how, is avatars, how are avatars understood in the film? Anybody know? I'm sorry. I, that's one I can't answer because I haven't seen the the film. Yes, sir. Any concept of creation? There is this, uh, like in Hinduism, the emergence of uh, an endless cycle of, of worlds. So it's not a one-time creation, but it is a cycle of repetition that happens in the course of Time, endless time. Any other? Well, you all have been very patient. I have thrown, uh, you know, I can do this in a semester, too. Uh, and that, in some ways, is a lot more fun. Um, but I want to thank you for your, your time, and uh, I'm grateful for the, the chance to be with you all. So, Grace, thank you.